Just over two years ago, I posted an online lecture called Get Strong, The Science of Bodyweight Strength Training. Now, overall, I was really proud and pleased with the content that I managed to put together for, for that video. But at the same time, two years have passed since then, and I'm somebody who's always looking to learn and is open to uh, changing my ideas and opinions if I'm presented with new information. So the time seemed right to expand upon that original video and potentially even go back and debate or correct some of the points which I made in part one. So let's start off by talking about goal setting. Within bodyweight strength training, there is a massive variety of different holds and elements which you can learn. So it can be all too tempting sometimes to try and work towards absolutely everything at the same time. Now as a beginner, this can work quite well, but as you start to get up into intermediate and advanced level bodyweight strength training, this often means that instead of learning everything at once, you end up making very, very small amounts of progress towards lots of different things. At the same time, if you are only working on one strength skill, then you could end up losing your kind of well-roundedness because you might be neglecting areas and muscle groups which are not um, directly impacted by that particular goal. So it is important, I think, to consider working towards the right amount of goals within any one training cycle. If you are clever, you can pick your targets so that they kind of complement each other because in bodyweight strength training, no one skill is kind of out on its own. If you work towards one element, then you'll find that that kind of transfers across into another element and you'll get better at other things without even necessarily meaning to. So for example, if you're working towards a Maltese, your planche would inevitably get better. If you were working on a V-sit, then you might notice an improvement in your compression when you do a pipe pressed handstand, for example. So you can work on several different skills at the same time, but from only one or two subsections. It's important to work goals from different subsections and different muscle groups to maintain that well-roundedness, but it also means that you can program your training quite smartly and quite effectively to make sure that you are never too fatigued for the session you're about to do. So for example, you might pick two anterior chain goals, so goals which are working the muscles at the front of the body, for example, pipe pressed handstand and uh, straddle planche, and you might work those on one day, and then you might work two goals that are gonna work the posterior chain. So for example, front lever and V-sit, and you work those the following day. And by alternating between the two subsections of goals, you can make sure that the muscles that are needed for that session are nice and fresh because they've been rested the previous day. In a given training week, you are going to have to work on lots of different exercises in order to move towards one goal. So it is important to make sure that you program your training week quite sensibly to make sure that you get the most efficiency possible out of the exercises that you do. Firstly, let's consider the effective structure of an individual workout. So it's important to have in mind and important to realize that even with a good amount of rest period in between sets, and even with like intra-workout supplementation and things like that, set to set, the amount of force that your body can produce, that your muscles can produce, is going to reduce. If you work really, really hard in a set, you are essentially reducing short term your body's ability to produce maximum force output by kind of between one and two percent for each set. Now this has two main implications. The first implication of this is that it's important to prioritize our exercises in the right order. Have the things which are most important to you, your primary goals, at the start of your session. You should also be doing at the start of your session any heavy eccentric work, isometric work, and skill-specific work, as these are the most kind of taxing for the central nervous system and are the things that require you to be the most fresh in order to complete. And then towards the back end of your session, this is when you can be doing your uh, kind of supplementary work, your higher volume work, uh, your less skill specific stuff to really break down the muscles, break down the body before the end of the session. The second thing to consider with this information is that we need to set a sensible limit to the amount of time you spend working out per day. As a really motivated athlete, you might want to just hit the gym for three or four hours and just absolutely destroy your body. But after a certain amount of time, your muscles will be so fatigued that anything you do after that point is going to be of very little use for you. So generally, the recommendation that I stick to is to do no more than like 30 good working sets within one session. And when I take into account warm-up time, rest periods, setting up, 
sharing equipment with other people and cooling down. This normally takes between two and two and a half hours. So generally I wouldn't spend more than about two or two and a half hours on strength training per day. Otherwise the stuff you do after that, you're really getting very little benefit from. All right, next we need to consider longer term planning and periodization. So to make good progress at any level of performance, it is important to, from time to time, take lighter weeks or deload weeks. Now, as a motivated athlete, this can be kind of frustrating to do less training for a week because it feels like you're slacking off. But it's important to remember and be mindful of the fact that it's actually very, very important for your long-term development and it will benefit you in the future. Alongside the obvious benefits of a deload week, such as reducing your risk of injury and reducing your risk of overtraining syndrome, Taking a deload week is also important to help unlock the strength that you have built during the previous training cycle. In much the same way that you lose strength set to set within a training session, you can also temporarily lose strength session to session without a significant period of rest. If you are six weeks into a training program and you've been hitting it hard four or five times a week the entire time, you may actually appear weaker than when you first started just because your body is exhausted. Now this can obviously be really, really frustrating, but if you take that week off and allow your muscles to fully recover, then you will see the benefits of that six weeks of hard graft. Generally, it would be my recommendation to take a lighter training week to allow your body to recover every six to eight weeks. Now a deload week doesn't have to be a week where you don't train at all. It just needs to be a week where you allow your muscles to recover and train very sensibly. So during this week, I certainly wouldn't do any heavy, like one rep max or low repetition training. I wouldn't do any eccentrics or isometrics, but doing kind of 60 to 80% um, of your maximum concentric work can be good just to keep the muscles active. And a deload week is also a really, really good time to do your maintenance work. So do some rehab, do some prehab, do some stretching and make sure that your body is feeling healthy and good ready for the next training cycle. At the end of your deload week when you've had maybe five or six days of rest already that's the perfect time to do your strength testing. So try out the goals that you've been working towards and hopefully you'll see that you're closer than you were last time you did deload week. In part one of this video I spoke at some length about how we can manipulate training volume to either preferentially stimulate neuromuscular adaptation or hypertrophy or endurance or combinations of the three. I mentioned that training specifically for hypertrophy for muscle growth is not advantageous for body weight strength training because if your body becomes massive, it becomes heavier, it becomes harder to move around in space. Now, I'm happy to agree with that point, but I'm also happy to suggest at this point that hypertrophic training and high volume training are not necessarily the same thing. When I made part one of this video, I kind of blindly assumed that if you did more than about six repetitions of an exercise, you would just become huge overnight. And obviously there's a lot more to it than that. Nutrition is a huge part of this. So if you engage in high volume training and you have a big surplus of calories, a big surplus of protein, then you create the optimal conditions for muscle growth. But if any one of those things is missing, then the ability for your body to grow muscle mass is kind of compromised. I think if we pay very close attention to our diet, it is possible for us to gain strength benefit from high volume training without necessarily becoming enormous. It's very important as a bodyweight athlete to take in a good amount of calories and a good amount of protein to make sure that we recover well and to make sure that we've got energy for our sessions, but you should certainly not be consuming as much protein or as many calories as, for example, a bodybuilder or a weightlifter. Very low volume and high intensity exercise through a small number of repetitions or a small amount of time under tension is what is obviously most specific for bodyweight strength training. But there are several benefits to higher volume, higher repetition training, which I have kind of become more aware of over the last couple of years. One of the main benefits of higher volume training is the benefits that that can have for kind of your joint health and for rehab and prehab. So in strength training, it is important that your wrists, your elbows, your shoulders, your forearms, 
are very, very strong and well prepared because all of these joints are under a huge amount of pressure during most of the strength elements that we perform. Uh, and the ligaments and the tendons and the cartilage in these joints tend to respond best to very high volume training. If we do lots and lots of repetitions of an exercise, it gets a good amount of blood flow going through that area, which supplies the ligaments, the tendons, the connective tissues with the nutrients they need and helps them to become stronger. So generally for any kind of rehab or prehab or joint preparation, kind of between 15 and 50 even more than 50 repetitions is the best kind of training range to be looking at. You're certainly going to get a very little benefit from doing fewer than 15 repetitions if it's a rehab or prehab exercise. Generally work with a low load until you feel like a good metabolic burn until you can feel a good accumulation of lactic acid in the area and then you know that you're going to be strengthening that area quite nicely. A second benefit of this kind of lower load, higher volume style of training is a psychological one. So if you are always training at the absolute limit of your current ability, then a lot of the time you're going to fail, which is going to be quite depressing. And even if you don't fail, it's quite likely that you're going to be using some kind of poor technique or some kind of cheating to complete the movement or complete the repetition. If you drop the ego slightly and either use a lower weight or use a little bit more assistance with the skill that you're doing, it gives you a really nice opportunity to train the skill with correct technique, perfect your form, and also embed in your head that it is actually possible. It is much better for your development to succeed at an easier variation several times than it is to fail at a harder variation several times. So don't be afraid to take a step back and use that time to improve your form and improve your mind-muscle connection with that skill. The third and potentially most powerful benefit of higher volume strength training is in order to break through plateaus. So as we've already mentioned, doing the skill or doing very high load, low volume style training is most specific to bodyweight strength training. And as a beginner, you can make good progress just by doing this style of training. But as you get into intermediate and advanced level bodyweight strength training, chances are your progress is gonna slow down if you continue to just do this due to the principle of diminishing returns. If you do the same thing over and over again, training session to training session, your muscles learn to expect it and they actually adapt less to that stimulus over time. In order to continually progress, you need to kind of keep your muscles guessing because muscles respond more well to new stimuli rather than something that they've already experienced several times before. There's a great quote by Albert Einstein. I don't think he was talking about strength training at the time, but I feel it's relevant to this topic, which is insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, yet expecting different results. So I think that's a really powerful quote and particularly relevant to bodyweight strength training. If you've been doing the same training program for many months or many years and you've not really moved any closer to your goals in that time, then it might be time to switch up what you're doing a little bit. And rather than just training in that neuromuscular adaptation zone, being willing to shock your muscles and do some different styles of training. So a really useful method, which a lot of advanced practitioners use, is a method called daily undulating periodization, which means that essentially session to session, you change the volume of your workload completely. So it might be that one session you do your skill specific, high load, low volume work. Next session you do accessory work through quite high volumes. Next session you do circuit training and then you go back to your skill specific work. So your muscles never get the chance to get used to something because each session you give them something new to work with and over time hopefully that will allow you to progress further. To make progress in body weight strength training, consistency is key but consistency is not necessarily the same as repeating yourself. Consistency means training regularly and working towards the same goals over a certain amount of time, not necessarily doing the same things over and over again. We now finally turn our attention to optimal training methods for building strength and efficiency over size. So in part one, I suggested that three was the magic number and that three repetitions was the absolute best way to build strength. I'm now more tempted to suggest a working range of kind of two or three reps to eight repetitions to line up directly with the hypertrophic range of eight to roughly 15 repetitions, which makes um, 
between six and ten repetitions of an exercise, kind of the, the best of both worlds middle ground area. This is all very useful information, but one of the main limitations of these numbers is that in bodyweight strength training, we're not always doing repetitions of an exercise. A lot of what we do is isometric training or eccentric training, and these numbers offer no advice as to how best to go about that kind of training. In gymnastics, for a skill to be considered completed, it needs to be held for a minimum of two seconds. So we might consider your one repetition max as being uh, the most advanced strength element that you can hold for two seconds. For that reason, let's consider uh, one repetition as being energetically equivalent to kind of two seconds in a static position. By expanding the original numbers, we can now suggest that the optimal working range for building strength in a static position is holding that position for between roughly 5 and 15 seconds. Eccentric exercises are a lot more intense than isometric exercises, so I would say the optimal time under tension for an eccentric exercise is a steady uh, decline from the top of the movement to the bottom of the movement, that going a consistent speed for between 5 and 8 seconds. Based on that information, here is an updated version of the original diagram which I used in part one, which hopefully is a little bit more useful for you to use.